okay, so let's now talk about what some people say then. They say, okay, well, then what can, can the, the Jews do to help ensure, to help try and change the conversation with the Palestinians, right? And so one of the things they'll bring up is the issue of settlements, sure. right? You knew, knew that was you coming. Going, knew yeah. you were going there. Yeah, and yeah. they'll say, look, even if, and we'll talk about the legality of the settlements and all that kind of stuff, they, they'll say, even if it might be legal what the Jew, or disputed what's going on in terms of what the mm-hmm. Jews are doing in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria or whatever you want to call it, um, do these, are these things really uh, constructive to, to bringing peace? So I'm going to throw all that your way and you, you can do with it what you want. Okay. I first want to start with legality because I think that's a lot easier. Um, and most people would say I'm crazy for thinking that. But the legality of settlements is, is, most people would say it's not disputed. They would say very clearly they are illegal under international law. And, and I've heard this for years. And I really would keep asking, based on what? What, where in international law does it talk about settlements and how they are illegal? And I've always been quoted the exact same thing. Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Conventions. That's where it says it. So then I went back and I read Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Conventions, which I would actually challenge most people who tell me this to say, what does it say? It says, and I quote, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer its own civilian population into territories it is occupying Mm -hmm. or it occupies. Sorry if I misquoted it a little bit. I don't think I did, though. Okay. So I'm sure on the we'll surface, get a couple of YouTube comments for that, by the way. Again, I just said <laughs> that's pretty much what it says. The occupying power okay. shall not deport or transfer its own civilian Fine. population into territories it occupies. I'm pretty sure that's the direct quote. Mm-hmm. And let's look at it. Mm-hmm. On the most in surface level, has Israel ever deported or transferred its population into this territory? No. Israel has never picked people up and moved them, which is what deport or transfer implies. Have people moved there voluntarily? Yes. Has the Israeli government incentivized people to move there? Yes. But now we have to look at two other things. One, territory it occupies. There's a a really big issue here where the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, the status of it doesn't really sit solidly in international law. Why? Because today and since... May 15th, 1948, there has not been a legal sovereign of the West Bank. The line separating the West Bank, Judea and Samaria from Israel, the green line or the 1949 armistice line, and don't you dare let anybody call it the pre-1967 border. Why? Because they do it very strategically. It was never a border. It was never a border. What was? Oh, and right, who insisted upon that it not be a border were the Jordanians. Because if they accepted that it was a border, they would have to recognize the country on the other side of it. And they were definitely not doing that in 1949. (laughs) Interesting. It became an armistice line that Mm. separated these two territories. Which means that even in 1967, when Israel went to war with the Jordanians, after the Jordanians had started that war and started firing across that line in 1967, Israel didn't cross an internationally recognized border when entering into that territory. And so it doesn't fit this notion of, of occupied territory. Because if we're occupying it, who are we occupying it from? Now, the UN would say to me, well, the Palestinians. And I would challenge the UN and anybody else and say, with all due respect, when have the Palestinians ever been sovereign over this territory? And the answer is never. Mm. And by the way, if you're smart, you will challenge me back and say, but when have the Israelis ever been sovereign? And I would say, never. But if therefore, the, today, the Palestinians argue that it's the claim that it should be theirs, or the Israelis say that they have a claim to it as well, then that to me sounds like disputed territory, not occupied territory. And it doesn't fit the definition. So let's go back to Article 49. Article 49 says you can't deport or transfer your own population. Israel hasn't done that. It also says into territory you're occupying. Well, questionable about the territory. We never crossed an internationally recognized border. And then let's go to the actual core of what Article 49 was really all about. Because with international law comes context. The Fourth Geneva Convention, which is where you can find Article 49, is about humanitarian rights during wartime. So already we're kind of out of our game. Because... This isn't wartime. This has been 50 years since wartime. And then let's talk about the reason that Article 49 was actually drawn up. They looked at World War II. They looked at what the Germans did in World War II when occupying territory, how they would relocate, forcibly deport or transfer their own civilians into the territory that they had taken to Germanize that territory. This law was written to protect, ready for this? The human rights of, in that context, the Germans. Mm. Which means that in the context of Israel, this would be 
the article would be for the protection of Israeli citizens from their own government. And no Israeli citizen who lives in the settlements today is standing up saying that their human rights were violated by their own government when moving into this territory. They did so very much voluntarily. It doesn't fit. And it bothers me, I think, because I'm, I'm a stickler for facts. And there goes the UN, and there goes the International Court of Justice, who look at Article 49 and interpret it. And if I, in just five minutes, was able to pick apart Article 49 so simply, how could they so simply say, like the UN does in Resolution 2334, that Israel flagrantly is violating, that what we did constitutes a flagrant violation of international law? And that's a direct quote from 2334. And by the way, if you look at 2334, there's already such problems. Because you know what they say? They say Israel's building of settlements in occupied territories, in Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. They have rewritten history. And as a historian, it pisses me off. Because it's, it's, we need to have a conversation in what actually is the reality. And the reality is, is that this has never been Palestinian territory. So Maybe who, it was supposed to be. According to the, to the last internationally, international legal agreement, who did the territory belong to? Well, the last agreement, if you want to look at it, mm. the only agreement that we have that's legally binding is the British Mandate. Right. 1922. And, that, and nothing has superseded it And since. who does that give it to? The, the Jews. The, the Jews, right. Because it gives the whole territory to the Jews. Now that is, I think, and I'm, I'm not an international but law they expert. Also gave and Jordan, I, didn't they? Yeah, well, they gave Jordan to the Jordanians. It, it, right, in, in 22. Yes. Okay, at that point, that's when Jordan was... So, it ne so never was Jordan going to be part of... No, the, of course right, not. Right. Absolutely not. Jordan right. never had a claim to this territory whatsoever. No, no, no. Which is Jordan, why... I'm never was, with the, was, was Jordan going to be allocated to the Jews as well by the British. No. Well, not by the British. Once the, by right. the time the British had ratified it, there, there, that had already been done. The, right. the territory had already been given back to the, given to the Jordanians. Right. Or to the Hashemites, I should mm -hmm. say, who became Jordanians. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk... In, in, in specific terms. So it's just, it's frustrating because to say Palestinian territories occupied since 1967 is just an absolute rewriting of history. And that's why I go on campuses and people say to me, but it's, it, it was Palestinian. You guys took it in 1967 or you took it in 1948. And I, I acknowledge the, there were Arabs living there. Arabs who eventually come to identify as Palestinian. But with all due respect, they never had sovereignty over this territory. Fine. But now the question becomes. Yes. Is it helpful? Okay, and Are that's and you know what? Helpful? And this is the conversation that we should be having. Yeah, but that is the conversation. And, but it's not. It's not the conversation. Maybe it is more among the Jewish community. M yes, sure. But outside community. of the Jewish community, and even sometimes inside of it, I get told, like I was by an organization who sent out an email recently, and I won't name the organization, yeah. who after this this decision was made by the United States to kind of start to say that settlements are are not necessarily or not illegal. Mm. They didn't say they were so legal. You welcome the U.S. Decision and by the way, that, that well, I thought, I thought, you know, it's, that's what they said, right? Mark yes, that they were disputed. disputed. Yes, yes, and I think that's yeah. accurate, and I think that's that's that is a, uh, a a legitimate reading of international law. But that's not the conversation. So I sent this email back to this organization who emailed out a response to that saying, Don't, make no mistake, settlements are illegal under international law. And I responded saying, what, how, tell me. I'm really curious, I want you to convince me. Mm. And they said, Article 49. And I even said in my email, please don't quote me Article 49 because I know it and it doesn't prove it. And then they said, but look at all these consecutive uh, uh, rulings by the UN and by the ICJ. And I said, but they're, as far as I'm concerned, based on what I understand, they're just misinterpreting it. Mm. They're taking their bias and they're allowing it to cloud the reality. So, but does that matter? So if they reinterpret it. Does I it think it matters. Right. I, I'm, with all due respect, I'm, I'm, I'm not just going to sit here and act like, you know, anti-Jewish bias or anti-Israel bias doesn't exist because right. it does. But I'm saying if the international legal community misinterprets a prior legal, international legal agreement, They've just said it, it doesn't really matter whether they've interpreted or misinterpreted it. What's the new reality is it's, they've said it's illegal now. I think it matters because the only thing that can say that it's illegal is international law. And there's no international law that says so. But again, let's go back to your question, right? I would love to have the conversation. Instead of somebody just saying to me, they're illegal, they're illegal, they're illegal, there's no conversation here, they're illegal. 
let's have the conversation about whether or not they're helpful or not. Because I just showed in 10 minutes mm. how easily you, they, they, right. we can show that they exist in a gray area of international law. Right. So let's stop talking about law. Again, it goes back to theft of land. Every time it's about trying to say that we're breaking the law. Mm. Stop. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about whether it's right or wrong. Let's talk about whether or not it's helpful or not. Mm -hmm. Now again, those are hard questions to answer. Depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing that I would bring up always. Because it really bothers me. It, it, there's, a, a, there's a thorn in my backside when it comes to this. So, you know, a lot of people will say, well, they're not helpful. And the reason why is because they're going to prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank. As you build more and more settlements. Yeah, and also they might just incite more Palestinian yes. anger. Yes, and, and, and so there's two things we need to address here, right? One, the Palestinian anger. Let's go there. I would say that goes back to a, a miseducation. If Palestinians were taught that it's okay that Jews will live in their country, then that shouldn't bother them. Mm. The same way that I grew up in Israel, living alongside Arabs, mm. and when Arab communities grow in Israel, I don't get frustrated or angry and it doesn't cause me to become violent. Mm -hmm. So that's number one about that. We're, when, you, when you peel back one layer, what we've now gotten to is ideology. Yes, but they say, and it might may well be partly true, that this is really a ploy to prevent a and there are, and there, you can't deny it. Right. You can't deny it. There are absolutely some Jews whose intention when it comes to building in the West Bank in Judea and Samaria is to stop a Palestinian state. Yeah. You can't deny it. Right, but the point is, the even point if that's is, true, Jews should still be able to live in well, a Palestinian and state. And more than that, even right. if that was true, if the government decides, if the majority decides, like we did in Gaza in 2005, whether you were there with whatever intention you were there with, you were then expelled by the Israeli government. Right. That was a decision that was made over your head and you were dragged out kicking and screaming, but we did it. So, yes, let's take one step forward. And I would- settlements go, go, go so, grow so big and there's such a big Jewish It's a great population. question. It's a great question. They grow so big, it's impossible. Yeah. It's been 50 years. Right, what are the numbers? And there are about 420,000 Jewish settlers okay. in the West Bank. Okay. Alongside, and this number is heavily disputed, I'm going to use the most mainstream number that I could, the, the most middle of the road number, a number that I, yep. to a certain extent, trust. And that's the IDF who says there's approximately 2.7 million Palestinians living in the West Bank. Okay. Now, there are some who would reduce that number to less than 2 million. The Palestinians sometimes say that there's more than 3 million, 2.7 million approximately. Mm -hmm. So we're what, less than 10% of the population? I don't know how to do math right now. Yeah, but people will say, yeah, but if you keep encouraging settlements, it, yes, so more, but it's more been more. fifty years. And is it is it accelerating at the moment? No, building? No, no, it hasn't, and it hasn't for twenty years. Okay, now and what so if, wait, I got I got to okay, make this go, point go, go. though. I'm sorry because yeah. it's so important. I can't just beat around it. So my argument is, and I think I, not my argument, but the point that I want to raise that I think needs to be a point of discussion is every time somebody says to me, this prevents, this will prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. My response is no, because why can't Jews live in that Palestinian state mm. and be 20%, a 20% minority like, oh, the 22% Arab minority like we have in Israel mm. and have equal rights and have dual citizenship and be protected by the government but then the way the way that arabs are in israel right. now again don't get me wrong arabs are discriminated against it's unfortunate and it needs to change no doubt about how it. how are they discriminated in your view i mean Is it more on, of a, on more peer cultural? to peer cultural but i don't want to go into it but some of the comments being made lately about about the arab population in israel are disgusting and and racist and we need and and that, that, by whom you mean by, by, politicians by people or? by politicians and by people right you know, it's the reality. And we're not going to, and I think anyone who would deny it in Israel is just, oh, again, yeah. blind to the reality. Yeah. But would, you again, say, would, you, would you say it's, it's like endemic in Israel? No. Right. But it is absolutely a problem. Okay. It's hard to gauge. But I think, I think there's also, we need, to, we need to separate this notion of hating versus being afraid of. Because mm -hmm. I think those are two different things. And I mm -hmm. think there's a lot more Jews in Israel who might be afraid of Arabs because they've never met them. Um, and because of the reality of our conflict, and the rockets and all that. it's just, yeah, it's, it's, and it's sad. And it's, it's something that really needs to be dealt with. But if you go back and I say, why can't Jews live in a Palestinian state? Then when somebody says to me, settlements prevent a Palestinian state from being created, my response would be no. Settlements make it impossible for a Jew free Palestinian state to be created. And that's an important point mm. because up until now, the Palestinian authority has said to us that their country needs to be free of Israelis and free of Jews. And I ask the world, 
Why are you okay with that? Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? It's absolutely ridiculous that in the 21st it's century, insane. that in any future agreement, in, in past agreements, that Israel has taken it upon itself to say that when we when we were to pull out of that area, which we offered in 2000 in the Camp David offer, and then again in Olmert's offer in 2008, that when we were to withdraw from the vast majority, over 90% of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, that we would also remove every single Jew from that territory. Mm. Why? Mm. Why? Why is well, that okay? Also, do you not think also Jews would be scared to live in a Palestinian state? And they state might be. And that? they might be. But it's up. That it's their choice. The same way that you could have said, well, Arabs might be afraid to live in a Jewish state when it was established. And right. it, but it's their choice to stay or leave. I'm not going to just pull you out because you might be afraid. And you know what? It was. I, I thought about this last night. You know, when when after the British mandate, the notion was that this territory was going to become a Jewish state. And throughout the next three decades. Arabs continue to immigrate into that territory unabated and unfettered by the British. Isn't that the same thing? It's not a Palestinian state yet. Mm. But if we're talking about it becoming a Palestinian state, but it's not there yet, then shouldn't the British have stopped all Arab immigration into what was going to become the Jewish state? Mm. The way that now we're being demanded that we stop all Jews from moving into point. what would become a future Palestinian state? Yeah. I never thought about that until last night. But I think it's very valid. Yeah. And again, the notion of, well, you're going to move in so much that eventually you're going to become the majority. It's, it's been 50 years and we haven't gotten anywhere close. Right. And, what, and, and as long as, again, there is restrictions and it's not just like mass immigration, which I don't even think there is a will for mass immigration into this territory. No, no. It's not going to happen. Maybe the fear is that there could be a will for that and we, don't, we, don't, we want to stop it. And if that comes, then we could stop it. Okay. The simple fact is that the Israeli government has always controlled the numbers of, of right. how many people move into that territory. But what, 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 what would you say if people say, well, OK, fine. Jews have a right to go and live in, uh, in, in the West Bank. Yes. But um, w surely it's not fair then that Arabs from the West Bank area can't come and live in Israel. I disagree. Why? Because Israel is a sovereign state and it has the, it has the ability to say... But there's a slight imbalance there. I don't think so. I think if in the year 2000, if in the year 2000 the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat, had accepted the two-state solution that was proposed by Ehud Barak, and he would have had all of Gaza and he would have 97% or so of the West Bank. And the next day after they accepted that and a Palestinian state was declared and they said... Is that said, what their demands were? What do you mean? Is that what Arafat's demands were? Well... Or did that meet the Arafat's demands? Except for the right of return, which okay. is what we're actually touching right, upon, right? right? right. Yep. Israel refused to allow refugees to return inside of Israel. They yep. said, we will pay $30 billion to resettle refugees in your newly established state. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, the Palestinian government... The newly established government of the Palestinian state said, our immigration laws say that now the only people who can immigrate into this territory are Palestinians mm. and Arabs. Mm. That would have been 100% legal under international law mm. because every country has the right to decide who is allowed or not allowed to immigrate into their country. Mm. And so Israel is a sovereign nation. And Israel is a nation state, which is unique. And I understand that. It's, it's, it's very rare in the world today. And many people would say that it's an outdated concept. Mm. And I, you know, I was asked this just the other day at Exeter University. And my response was one that I think is very hard, which was, yeah, it is. It is. I think for most it is. But for us, it's the only thing we have. Mm. It's necessary for mm -hmm. us. Because unlike other groups of people or other oppressed minorities, we have been oppressed for 3,000 years mm. in every generation. It's never stopped. It has been endemic in the world. And so for us, our only way of knowing and being confident in our protection and our survival is having a nation state with a Jewish majority. To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content, and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.